Hey guys, Lord Naren White here, the Holy Ghost, the one true God. Back with you with the next video in my series, reading Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Without further ado, returning to Oliver Twist as read by Lord Naren White. Acting upon this suggestion, they adjourned a, to a neighboring apartment where Mr. Brittles, being called in, involved himself and his respected superior in such a wonderful maze of fresh contradictions and impossibilities, as tended to throw no particular light on anything, but the fact of his own strong mystification, except, indeed, his declarations that he shouldn't know the real boy, if he were put before him that instant, that he had only taken Oliver to be he, because Mr. Giles had said he was, and that Mr. Giles had, five minutes previously, admitted in the kitchen, that he began to be very much afraid he had been a little too hasty. Among other ingenious surmises, the question was then raised whether Mr. Giles had really hit anybody, and, upon examination of the fellow pistol to that which he had fired, it turned out to have no more destructive loading than gunpowder and brown paper, a discovery which made a considerable impression on everybody but the doctor, who had drawn the ball about ten minutes before. Upon no one, however, did it make a greater impression than on Mr. Giles himself, who, after laboring for some hours under the fear of having mortally wounded a fellow creature, eagerly caught at this new idea, and favored it to the utmost. Finally, the officers, without troubling themselves very much about Oliver, left the churchy constable in the house, and took up their rest for that night in the town, promising to return the next morning. With the next morning, there came a rumor that two men and a boy were in the cage at Kingston, who had been apprehended overnight under suspicious circumstances, and to Kingston Messrs. Blathers and Duff journeyed accordingly. The suspicious circumstances, however, resolving themselves on investigation into the one fact that they had been discovered sleeping under a haystack, which although a great crime is only punishable by imprisonment, and is in the merciful eye of the English law, and its comprehensive love of all the king's subjects held to be no satisfactory proof in the absence of all other evidence that the sleeper or sleepers have committed burglary accompanied with violence and have therefore rendered themselves liable to the punishment of death. Mrs. Mrs. Blathers and Duff came back again as wise as they went. In short, after some more examination and a great deal more conversation, a neighboring magistrate was readily induced to take the joint bail of Mrs. Maley and Mr. Losburn for Oliver's appearance if he should ever be called upon, and Blathers and Duff, being rewarded with a couple of guineas, returned to town with divided opinions on the subject of their expedition. The latter gentleman, on a mature consideration of all, sir, all the circumstances, inclining to the belief that the, burg the burglarious attempt had originated with the family pet, and the former being equally disposed to concede the full merit of it to the great Mr. Conky Chickweed. Meanwhile, Oliver gradually throve and prospered under the united care of Mrs. Maley Rose and the kind-hearted Mr. Losburn. If fervent prayers gushing from hearts overcharged with gratitude be heard in heaven, and if they be not, what prayers are? The blessings which the orphan child had called, child called down upon them sunk into their souls, diffusing peace and happiness. Chapter 32 Of the happy life Oliver began to lead with his kind friends. Oliver's ailings were neither slight nor few. In addition to the pain and delay attendant on a broken limb, his exposure to the wet and cold had brought on fever and ague, which hung about him for many weeks and reduced him sadly. But, at length, he began, by slow degrees, to get better, and to be able to say sometimes, in a few tearful words, how deeply he felt the goodness of the two sweet ladies, and how ardently he hoped that when he grew strong and well again, he could do something to show his gratitude, only something which would let them see the love and duty with which his breast was full, something, however slight, which would prove to them that their gentle kindness had not been cast away, but that the poor boy whom their charity had rescued from misery or death was eager to serve them with his whole heart and soul. "'Poor fellow,' said Rose." When Oliver had one day feebly had been one day feebly endeavouring to utter the words of thankfulness that rose to his pale lips, you shall have many opportunities of serving us if you will. We are going into the country, 
and my aunt intends that you shall accompany us. The quiet place, the pure air, and all the pleasure and beauties of spring will restore you in a few days. We will employ you in a hundred ways when you can bear the trouble. The trouble, cried Oliver. Oh, dear lady, if I could but work for you, if I could give... If I could only give you pleasure by watering your flowers, or watching your birds, or running up and down the whole day long to make you happy, what would I give to do it? You shall give nothing at all, said Miss Maylie, smiling. For as I told you before, we shall employ you in a hundred ways, and if you only take half the trouble to please us that you promise now, you will make me very happy indeed. Happy, ma'am, cried Oliver. How kind of you to say so. You will make me happier than I can tell you, replied the young lady. To think that my dear good aunt should have been the means of rescuing anyone from such sad misery as you have described to us would be an unspeakable pleasure to me. But to note that the object of her goodness and compassion was sincerely grateful and attached, in consequence, would delight me more than you can well imagine. Do you understand me? she inquired, watching Oliver's thoughtful face. Oh, yes, ma'am, yes, replied Oliver eagerly. But I was thinking that I am ungrateful now. To whom? inquired the young lady. To the kind gentleman and the, and the dear old nurse who took so much care of me before, rejoined Oliver. If they know, knew how happy I am, they would be so pleased, I am sure. I am sure they would. Oh, excuse me. I am sure they would, rejoined Oliver's benefactress. And Mr. Losburn has already been kind enough to promise that you, when you are well enough to bear the journey, he will carry you to see them. Has he, ma'am? Cried him. Has he, ma'am? Cried Oliver, his face brightening with pleasure. I don't know what I shall do for joy when I see their kind faces again. In a short time, Oliver was sufficiently recovered to undergo the fatigue of this expedition. One morning, he and Mister Losburn set out, according in a little carriage which belonged to Missus Maylie, when they came to Chertsey Bridge. Oliver turned very pale and uttered a loud exclamation. "'What's the matter with the boy?' cried the doctor, as usual, all in a bustle. "'Do you see anything, hear anything, feel anything, eh?' "'That, sir,' cried Oliver, pointing out of the carriage window. "'That house!' "'Yes. Well, what of it? Stop, coachman. Pull up here,' cried the doctor. "'What of the house, my man, eh? The thieves! The house they took me to!' whispered Oliver. "'The devil it is!' cried the doctor. "'Hello there, let me out!' But before the coachman could dismount from his box, he had tumbled out of the coach by some means or other, and running down to the deserted tenement, began kicking at the door like a madman. Helloa, is a little l ugly humpbacked man, opening the door so suddenly that the doctor, from the very impetus of his last kick, nearly fell forward into the passage. What's the matter here? Matter? exclaimed the other, collaring him without a moment's reflection. A good deal. Robbery is the matter. There'll be a murder, too. There'll be murder the matter, too, replied the humpbacked man coolly. If you don't take your hands off. Do you hear me? I hear you, said the doctor, giving his captive a hearty shake. Where's the conf Where's confound the fellow? What's his rascally name? Sykes, that's it. Where's Sykes, you thief? The humpbacked man stared, as if in excess of amazement and indignation, indignation. Then, twisting himself dexterously from the doctor's grasp, growled forth a volley of horrid oaths and retired into the house. Before he could shut the door, however, the doctor had passed into the parlor without a word of parley. He looked anxiously around. Not an article of furniture, not a vestige of anything, animate or inanimate, not even the position of the cupboard. Answer, uh, answered Oliver's description. Now, said the humpbacked man, who had watched him keenly, what do you mean by coming into my house in this violent way? Do you want to rob me or to murder me? Which is it? Did you ever know a man come out to do either, in a ch chariot and a pair? You ridiculous old vampire! said the irritable doctor. "'What do you want, then?' demanded the hunchback. "'Will you take yourself off before I do you a mischief? Curse you!' "'As soon as I, th as soon as I think proper,' said Mr. Losburn, 
looking into the other parlor, which, like the first, bore no resemblance whatever to Oliver's account of it. I shall find you out some day, my friend. <laughs> Will you? sneered the ill-favored cripple. And we'll go ahead and stop there for this week. As usual, I want to say thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoyed. Please like, comment, and subscribe, as it greatly helps the channel. Like to be with you all. Take care, and thanks again.